So Mary will conduct a conversation with Blake for about 40 minutes, and then they will take questions from our virtual audience. Please click on the question box below to type in your questions, and Mary will be sure to get to as many as she can. We will try to end this program after about one hour. Again, thanks to the Leon Levy Foundation for funding this and all our other events. Blake, I want to offer my congratulations once again on this formidable accomplishment. And I also want to note that Blake Bailey has just been chosen as the Leon Levy lecture um, that is going to be given and is given every September. Um, and it's a, certainly a big honor and we're really pleased that Blake can do it in September. Mary, I now turn the rest of this evening's event over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kai. And I also want to thank uh, the Leon Levy Foundation and the Leon Levy uh, Center for Biography. If you're new to this space, I, you're gonna you're in for so many great events and videos and recordings. Blake. Mary, hi. We go way back, me and Blake. We go way back. We go way back, and we we uh, we met in Philip Ross's apartment, uh, having dinner. Um, Mary just, doing, Mary just disappeared from my screen, by the way. Um, and the name Julie Seiler is there instead. That can you do anything about that? That no, I guess not. Where right. you are, you're back. Yeah. Um, Thad, please keep Mary on the screen if it is technically possible. Um, in, in, in point of fact, I met Mary, um, she doesn't remember, at the National Book Critics Circle Award uh, the, the night before they give the awards where you do readings. And I spotted Mary Carr sitting in like the front row and I was a huge fan. So fangirl that I am, I went up and sat down next to her and said, hi, I'm, I'm Blake Bailey, you're Mary Carr. Wow, you know, I'm a big admirer of her, yours. She went, oh, you wrote the Cheever book, right? And she was frantically looking <laughs> over her shoulder so she could get away from this lunatic. And happily, she spotted a friend and uh, bolted over was, there. I was waiting for my editor, and I, want, I wanted to know. she. I'd saved her a seat. Courtney Fair you? enough. The next time we met was indeed at Phillip's uh, apartment. Would you like to take it from there, Mary? Um, uh, well, gosh, I... I he ran pretty hard at you. I mean, I, he he always runs at people kind of hard on the front end, and then he becomes a squishy doll baby. And uh, I, he said, why should a Gentile from Oklahoma, you know? Write my biography. Write I want to say just a little bit more about that dinner. Um, your friendship with Philip started pretty late, like about 2015. Is that right? That's right. Right. And Philip was eager for me to, to get us together with him for that dinner. However, he, he discouraged my actually having a formal interview with you because, one, he was fond of you and wanted you to himself. And two, he was so sick of my snooping by then, you know, and, and the snooping had sort of turned pretty rancid um, at various points. So, yeah, so he didn't want that to taint uh, his friendship with you. So that's why, Mary, um, there's not much of Mary Carr in my book because yeah, Philip know, was holding me at arm's length. I just, you had people who, I was there when he was dying. I mean, there were people who'd known him 60 years, 78 right. years. I mean, come on, I, I, I was a latecomer to the uh, Philip Roth show, but um, I didn't know he had discouraged you from interviewing me. I didn't know that mm -hmm. because I, I rem he said to me when he was dying, actually, uh, uh, you're going to have to defend me when I'm dead. And I said, Philip, you're indefensible. <laughs> and he just roared laughing. He just thought that was hilarious. Um, Tell me, you know, let's, let's, let's go ahead and have the conversation. We, we didn't have uh, for my biography. How did you meet Philip and sort of how did it proceed from there? 
I, I met him at, and I was very good friends already for many decades with Don DeLillo. And Don had said, uh, you you should meet Roth. He, he had said that several times. You should meet Roth. You should meet Roth. And I was sort of, I had met Roth a couple of times. I'd been at big public events with him. And he's he's not at his best at those events. He's very, yeah. uh, very defended. And so, um, uh I met him at Antonio Monda's house and I was having lunch and Don kind of made sure that after lunch, the three of us sat on a little, a little tiny settee where you hold your, your uh, plate on your knees. Um, and he asked me to dinner and I said, great. And then he called me, he took my number. He called me and, and we made a plan to meet. And I walked into Eli's and, uh, as we call him, the Ghanif. I walked into the Ghanif and he said, um, just so you know, when I sat down, I, uh, you're too old for me to sleep with. He was, you know, he was 82 and I was like 60. Right. And I said, Philip, I have not thrown any pussy at you. Like, don't get your hopes up, dude. Um, and it seemed like from then on, everything between us was very simple and very, um, square and uh, we had it was one of the great conversations of my life I've got to say I mean and he could not have been kinder to me as a friend I mean he was a real friend right I mean the the the, the talk uh, around my biography uh, has often been extremely um, nasty uh, where Philip is concerned. And I would ask people who are talking about canceling Philip, this, this conversation is especially rife in Europe right now, especially in England, because the Daily Mail and the London Times wrote semi-approving pieces about the prospect of canceling Philip Roth, given certain revelations in my book. Bear in mind a, a couple of things. There are more. One, Whatever the occasional raffishness of Philip's private life, um, he spent the vast majority of his waking hours alone in a cottage in the woods of Connecticut, standing at a desk, sometimes for 12 hours a day. Um, how much harm can you do in that blameless activity and creating, I might add, great art? Um, the other thing, if you were a friend, as, as Mary was, of Philip Roth, um, and say you got sick and you went into the hospital, um, he would visit you constantly. He would offer to cover your medical expenses. He did this constantly. He would get on the phone and call your friends and see if they were able to chip in and help out, and so on. Part of Philip was a darling man, a loyal, sweet-natured, funny um, wonderful guy. But also so, a nice Jewish boy, despite... A his nice life. Jewish boy. Absolutely. Um, so that's your defense of him? That's it? That's all I got? No, no, no. Ask, ask me some questions, Mary. I'll defend him more. No, but I mean, I'm, I'm, I didn't see... I wish I'd seen the piece in the, that came out of the UK. What, what was their... What was their... Um, ar what was the argument for... Um, uh, the argument for canceling him is that his uh, treatment of women was deplorable, um, that he used Joel Canero when Joel would, you know, uh, pick students for his oversubscribed classes at Penn, um, that he used Joel, in Joel's word, as a pimp to pick uh, good-looking young women for Philip to sleep with. I should add that Philip only slept, actually slept and had affairs with uh, two of his Penn students. I am not saying that in an improving way by any means, but it was a different time. The relationships were eminently consensual. Uh, there was no question about the students' grades being affected because they were both brilliant. Uh, one of them graduated summa from Penn and went on to graduate school at uh, Princeton. Um, and the third uh, student that Philip had a, an affair with of, of any sort of significance was Lucy Warren, uh, Lucy Warner, pardon me, 
um, at the Iowa Writers Workshop, and only six years separated her from Philip, who was quite young at the time. He was 28, and he was trapped in a, a ghastly marriage. Um, and eventually, those two, 50 years later, reconnected and became dear, dear friends. So it's not as sinister as they make it out to be. It's, you know, but I mean, um, and various the, other things in the book. And, that, and Clara Bloom, Mary. Of that generation of writers, I mean, I just, I mean, or, or, let's, ju let's exclude writers. Let's just say any men born before 1980, let's say. Um, which of them could not be indicted for just unbelievable? I mean, I always say they ought to all be put on an island, and every time they say something piggish, just be hit with rubber chickens. By they should be put on. Well, okay, island. thank you, Mary. Um, Philip said a lot of extremely piggish things. I mean, I'm not his unstinting advocate by any of. Um, I won't use his term for it, but not only did he like to chase chase women, uh, whether he was married or not, um, he made incredibly tasteless jokes about it. And if you took exception to the jokes he made about it, he would mock you. <laughs> and he put a lot of these jokes in his books, uh, Sabbath Theater, Fort Noise. Let, let me, let me name one of them. When... Um, Sabbath was contemplating suicide and he was thinking of what he wanted to put in his will. And he thought he would leave a bequest to the university that had just fired him for sexting with one of his undergraduate students. He would leave a bequest of $500 a year um, to be given to the graduating uh, senior female who had fucked most of her, more male professors than any of her classmates. And um, Philip said, and, and like to say that uh, Mickey Sabbath was the most autobiographical character he ever created, okay? That's likely to, to rub some people the wrong way. But do you think that that's true? Was he most like Mickey Sabbath? Only one side of him was most was like Mickey Sabbath, but that side decidedly so, yes. But was he worse than Saul Bellow, who was just more closed-mouthed about it? No, 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 not not at all. I mean, as I say in my book, I mean, was Philip, Philip was essentially, if, if we if we want to be reductive about it, and we might as well be within, you know, the constraints of the limited conversation, he was a tripartite, com compartmentalized personality. There was the isolado, um, who was devoted to perfecting his craft. Um, and I think that's the dominant part of uh, Philip's adult personality. There was a nice Jewish boy who was the patsy who'd been suckered into marriage by crazy Maggie, his first wife. After, his, wife, after his father kind of told him his whole life, he was going to be deceived and be a schmuck. And then he got deceived by, we should tell the story. Yeah, of course. Read the book. Here's what happened. Uh, Maggie Martinson was a secretary and, and short order waitress um, at the University of Chicago. She was five years older than Philip. Um, she had two children, both of them emotionally troubled and all but illiterate, um, and, you know, from a previous marriage. And they met in 1956, and they'd been on and off, you know, in a very um, volatile relationship for about two and a half years. And Maggie had lost her apartment in New York, and she was living, as Philip tells it, you know, because of his, you know, generosity, he had given her a place to sleep until she could find another apartment. And one day, he found out she had pawned his typewriter. She found he found the pawn ticket, and that was it. That 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 tore it, you know. And and he, a lot of bad stuff had happened coming up to that discovery. And he said, you have to go. This, this, is, this, this is enough. And uh, she said, I can't. I'm pregnant. And um, he said, prove it. He gave her a jar. And she took the jar to Tompkins Square Park, and she found an obviously pregnant woman. And for two or three dollars, she got some urine from the woman, which established that she was pregnant. And Philip agreed to marry her. 
And this disaster uh, went she on would, for if she would terminate the pregnancy, if she would terminate the pregnancy, which she gladly agreed to do because there was no pregnancy to terminate. Oh, um, so Philip felt that he had been used as a patsy. Um, and indeed he had. Philip always had terrible judgment um, of people who were bent on exploiting him one way or the other. And um, he said, you know, Chekhov said, I had to squeeze the surf out of me drop by drop. And Philip said, I had to squeeze the nice Jewish boy out of me drop by drop so that I would never be duped that way again. Um, so, you know, but he never squeezed the nice Jewish boy out of them altogether. So you have the isolado, you have the nice Jewish boy, and you have Mickey Sabbath. And Mickey Sabbath was a not by any means inconsiderable part of, of Philip's personality. But I would, I would just like to say, I mean, I knew him so late in his life uh, that maybe if I had met him earlier, we would never have been friends given who I am and who he was. But um, as, as you saw on his deathbed, Jesus Christ. It happens. I have the ringer turned off my phone. Why is it ringing? Sorry, decline. There we go. I apologize, everybody. Not at all. I turned the ringer off and it's ringing anyway. Um, uh, yeah, maybe we wouldn't have been friends at all, but at his deathbed, I mean, I've never seen so many smart women in my life. And, right. you know, me, Judith Thurman, uh, Barbara, who had been the head of the theology department at Hunter. Susie, and, Julia, and Mudge, who was 86 the, years old and had to have a helper get her there. Right, uh, yeah, the, who was a, ran a famous Virginia stud farm. In a horse farm. Right. Um, Julia, who's a psychiatrist, um, you know, just enormously, Judith Thurman, um, who the great biographer who was speaking in, in this venue not so long ago, and I was in the audience, and me. I mean, it was not... You know, I, I I don't know. I mean, they were all so smart and so accomplished. So I, you know, I abhorred these guys who prayed on their, used their uh, class rosters for dating lists. That doesn't happen anymore. I mean, there's a reason we talk about it now. But at that time, it was, you know, it was common practice. Absolutely. I'm, I'm trying to, Brooke Allen, uh, reviewed my book in the new criterion and she she is of a certain age and she went so far and these are her words not mine is saying judging a person of Philip's generation is impertinent and presumptuous. That's what Brooke Allen said. Well, um, I, I do judge him. I do. Sure. I judge. The whole gener I judge the generations of men going back to Adam. You know, I judge them all. But I also have spent a lot of time in China where they have, you know, done a cultural purge. And I've seen, you know, it's, it's, uh, that's not my way of a, that's not my way of approaching it. Um, it's, it's, I think it's important to have the conversation and not act like that's not part, but I, I also think of the Chekhov quote when I think of Philip's work, um, uh, that it's not the writer's job to solve a problem, but to represent it. 
Right. And I think representing yeah. um, the priapism and the predatory priapism of Nikki Sabbath. Um, Um, is in a way does a great service to the feminist movement. I mean, I think, you know, but it's I think so too, you know, and, and Philip said, to that class at Bard, and this is in my book, you know, they were roasting him because his, um, they were saying that, you know, his male characters have roundness and his female characters are invariably, which is not true, um, flat or unsympathetic. And, and, Philip said, and Philip, you know, was unflappably uh, civil in the face of that onslaught. I have video. And he said, you know, I want to know um, how women think. Don't you want to know how men think? <laughs> you know, and I think that is a great service that, 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 You know what? The problem is that's all we heard like for like two thousand years. So I'm gonna. Pass. They said that too, Mary. <laughs> that's all we've heard about for two. two. thousand years. Right. Um, uh, but he was still. He. He. I did want to go back to how hard he ran at you about being a. Gentile from Oklahoma, because I just think your answer was priceless. Um, oh, to under well, it was the only question he, you know, that 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 interview that grilling went on for about three hours. That was the first question, and um, and it was the only. I was prepared for. Um, I, 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 I mean, I am a Gentile from Oklahoma, you know. I, it's, it's not the logical choice. Um, and I said, I, I, I'm not a bisexual alcoholic with an ancient Puritan lineage, but I wrote a biography of John Cheever. Which, which by the way, is, is pretty much what Philip wanted to hear, you know, because all his career, um, he said, I am not a Jewish American writer. I am an American writer who happens to be a Jew. And he, for any number of reasons, he did not want to be uh, judged through a Jewish lens, certainly not a Jewish moral uh, lens. He wanted me to bring a, that, that, as he saw it, a kind of objectivity. to the task. And, and, and I think I did. Can I also quickly speak to what you, the other Chekhov chestnut, chestnut that you invoke, which is, um, you know, it's not, it's, it's not the, the, uh, 
artist. Uh, it's, not the, it's not the artist's job to solve. A to solve a problem, but to present it properly. To represent and, it accurately, yeah. Right. And, um, you know, there have been two or three extremely vicious reviews uh, of, of my biography um, by people I would venture to say uh, knew what they wanted based basically to write on the subject of Philip Roth before they read or wrote a word and went looking for stuff that served their purposes. But um, basically they say leaves me bemused because um, that's, I would, that, can I, well, that suggests that when I say that Joel Canero felt like he was, you know, uh, fulfilling the role of a pimp um, as an esteemed administrator at the University of Pennsylvania, that I, uh, that, that people will think it's a good thing to play the role of a pimp. Um, indeed, my including that assumes on the part of the reader that it is deplorable to force a friend into the role of a pimp, even in 1971. Um, so I think I'm presenting, I'm presenting the problem as Chekhov would have. I think you, pre I think you present the problem. And I think, um, I mean, in some ways you talk about how, you know, I, I think you're more interested in a way with, um, I mean, I was thinking about the Cheever book and which if you guys haven't read Blake's uh, biography of John Cheever and, and Richard Gates, I haven't read the Charles Jackson, but I own it. Um, two unbelievably great, like seminal biographies. And I knew Richard Gates a little bit. So in Cambridge back in the day. So um, I didn't know that. And I was a total Cheever maniac. Those stories are just faultless. Um, I, it's funny though, like his performance of that ugly male sexuality. I don't like Sabbath theater. No, it's it's not among my favorite. I've never it's liked favorite walking. Way. I mean, he loved that book. But you know, I've got to say, it's almost a cliche to me, uh, not the book. But um, from like mid 19th century France all the way to the present day to say, I'm not a woman. writer I'm not a Jewish writer I'm not I can't be categorized I'm sweet generis I mean it's that very precious symbolist uh, um, you know capital R romantic uh, refusal of anything that smacks of religion or anything that smacks of piety or anything, and, the, and the, how do you free yourself from these strictures of the church and, and this puritanism? It's through boning everything with a pulp. And it's, it's actually a very kind of fifth grade boys libidinal engine that runs through A lot, I mean, you see it in Baudelaire, you see it in Rambeau, you see it in Philip, you know, you see it in a lot of, a lot of male writers, not so many women writers. Did you give Philip that spiel, Mary? Oh my God. Do you think I didn't? <laughs> I, I, I'm saying, I, I, no, I'm not.
not saying that it doesn't happen anymore. I'm saying, uh, I'm, of course, men hit on their students all the time, but um, I'm saying it's not accepted. I'm not saying. Thing it doesn't happen anymore. I'm saying it's not accepted. It's not acceptable. It shouldn't have been acceptable then. I had, you yeah, know, when when Philip Philip used to love to teach, and and by the way, he was a superb teacher. Um, read uh, you you listeners out there. Uh, read Lisa Scott line. I hope I. saying that right she's she's quite a successful writer um she was in one of philip's classes at penn in the early 70s and uh philip was delighted by her piece it was in the new york times in 2014 but <laughs> if you philip did not you know wear the lechery on his sleeve quite the op Opposite. He was one of the few professors that they called Mr. Roth and whom he called Miss or Mr. Um, and he was always meticulously prepared. And of course, brilliant uh, in his insights and devoted to teaching. He loved teaching. But that Experience at Bard in 1999, uh, you know, sitting in on Norman Manya's class, that ended teaching for Philip. <laughs> he saw the way the wind was turning, and uh, he never... You know, he, he would sit in on, like, uh, Nicole Krause's, another brilliant, formidable woman friend of his, Nicole Krause's class, or... Ben Taylor's class, but he wasn't interested in teaching himself anymore um, because, yeah, just because. Um, I wanted to talk, you called Roth an, an obsessive, and I, I don't want to focus this much on, um, I, I'm sort of, and I'm such a fangirl of biography that being able to talk to you about biography, I just want to ask some very dumb questions. Please. That I've all, that I, I, I've asked Robert Caro these questions, so you're not the only person I've inflicted this kind of this kind of question on. How do you organize? Like I, I always, have, you know, I've asked Judith Thurman this, and she's a very good friend of mine, and I've I've seen how OCD she is in organizing things. How is how you organize your material different now, say with the Roth biography, than it was with Richard Yates or than it was with Cheever. Can you talk a little bit about both online and physical documents and how you catalog them? And it's a very nerdball question, but I've always wanted to. I love it. And I, and I hope I can give a concise and helpful answer to that because, it, 
Mary, when I accidentally became a biographer, and it was a happy accident that I stumbled on Richard Yates as a subject, I stopped writing terrible fiction and uh, stuck to what I was good at. Um, the thing I do best is create the architecture of my book. And I really sweat over it. I mean, I take a couple of years with the mountain of material, winnowing it, winnowing it, winnowing it down, structuring it, you know, plugging this here and plugging that there. What I do, once I know that uh, my research is done, and Kai Bird and I are going to have a conversation about this uh, at greater length uh, next month. Um, but I, I, so my computer is about to explode. Load. Okay, by the time I'm done. I've been at it for, in Philip's case, researching for six years. I haven't written a word because I don't write a word until I'm done with all my research. Um, I lie down on the couch with a legal pad, and uh, off the top of my head, I write down, it, 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 brainstorming. every major theme and episode from my subject slot that I can think of offhand, because if you have to consult, you know, um, the record or documents, then it can't be that important if it doesn't automatically occur to you. Um, once I'm done with that, and that takes me hours, you know, I fill up a whole legal pad. I type well, it up. It would be early life, Jewish experience, ancestry, or no? Or is it the uh, but, but also individual key episodes. For example, you know, that terrible fight he had when he was home from Bucknell with his father, who said, how do I know where you are? You could be in a whorehouse. You're a plum. You're a plum, you know, because, which he put into indignation. Um, that he, he, he had this father and this mother who just doted on him and knew in their bones that a catastrophe lay ahead for him. And uh, so they had this terrible fight. And... So finally, you know, when I'm typing it all up, I see, ah, well, that's repetitive, that's repetitive. This episode belongs attached to this theme, okay? Anatole Broyard, remember we had that little uh, conflict about where I put the Anatole Broyard anecdote? Well, rightly or wrongly, it belongs toward the end because that's when Philip, in chapter 49, almost toward the end of my book, misremembers his friendship with Anatole Broyard when he's writing that dumb Wikipedia piece about the human stain, you know, which is about a, a black man passing his wife. And Philip was so angry, they all said it was about Anatole Broyard. And I tell that story from the 60s when Anatole would send his new school students over to Philip's apartment to get laid. Remember? Um, it belonged there. You know, he, 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 uh, there's all sorts of a chronological stuff because I'm more of a thematic organizer. And finally, when you have everything plugged in and you've typed it all up and you're moving it around, it begins to kind of congeal in your head. Do you ever put it up on the wall, like around a room? Do you ever I have to do that. that? That's John McPhee in the in the sixties and seventies. That's uh, what I do. That's what I do. That's what. That's I do. what. Oh, and that's and that's Mary Carr. Um, no, I had uh, by by the by by the end, by the time I was ready, finally, finally to start writing after seven and a half years on Philip, um, I had an eighty-page structure on my computer, you know, with every little episode and blah blah blah, and I used that to put the material together and boil it down. 
And so those were individual moments that it was not a chronology. That's what I want to know. No, absolutely not. Again, it's more thematic than chronological. That's why a 1965 Anatole Broyard uh, anecdote goes at the very end of the book. Um, but essentially, it's a cause and effect narrative because I don't I don't believe in in fucking around with a cause and effect narrative. You want to keep you want your reader to keep turning the pages, right? right. Um, but yeah, anyway. So finally, uh, I'm I'm ready to start plugging. So look, and the last thing I have to say in response to this is that you have like the Maggie urine ruse. I had like 15 versions of that story from various people who'd heard Philip tell it this way. He'd written it in My Life as a Man this way. He'd read it, read, written it in the facts this way. Maggie had written in her journal, which I had, this way. And you have to collate all that and throw out the, the less reliable and less lively versions and so on. That's how I proceed. And I'm very meticulous. I'm very, <laughs> I'm very, very proud. Of, of how I go about that because it's the most, for me, it's the funnest part of the whole process. And did you do the same kind of thing with the Cheever biography? I've always proceeded that way. Again, I learned that while writing my first biography about Richard Yates, this is what I'm truly good at. This is what I should do. Um, so there's, there's nobody... There's, there's no other, you didn't start at some point and do it all in chronology. It, is it different working with a, with a living subject than a dead one? Because you met Ben. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, happily, Philip had kind of learned his lesson by the time I came into the picture. Um, Philip had conceived his biography initially in 1996 as a riposte to the recently published memoir by Claire Bloom, Leaving a Doll's House, which presented him as a Machiavellian misogynist, okay? And let me say to that, okay, Leaving a Doll's House did permanent irreparable harm to Philip, Philip's reputation and arguably prevented him from getting the Nobel Prize. Um, it is true, as Claire writes, that Philip was, you know, rampantly adulterous. And it is true that he quite abruptly, without much warning, left her, abandoned her. Um, and that's not, a, that's, that's not a, a good way to behave. However, he was not this sinister Machiavellian um, figure bent on persecuting uh, Claire and her daughter Anna, and indeed, Claire often of often said. Claire often said in public interviews, "It was the most wonderful relationship of my life." Now, both her book and the wonderful relationship business cannot be true, um, and I would venture to suggest that it was more the wonderful relationship than than not. But getting back to that, he he commissioned his best friend, and Ross was his best friend to write the biography, because essentially what Philip wanted was to write the biography by proxy. To okay. stick his hand in the back of Ross's head and, and right. tell him what to say, right? Exactly. A ventriloquist dummy is what he wanted. That blew up in his face in, in every conceivable way. Uh, was, uh, Ross resented being used that way. Ross was a bumbler, a consummate bumbler. He wouldn't do the interviews. He wouldn't do the legwork. He, he was totally ill-suited. He did not know what he was doing. So they parted ways, and I came into the picture, and I said, Philip, I will give you the same deal that I, I've given the estates of my three previous subjects. You must cooperate with me absolutely. You must give me every pertinent document. You must make yourself available for interviews. Encourage your friends, your family, your lovers, your enemies to talk to me in exchange for which you can vet the manuscript for factual accuracy. He told you not to talk to me. That's so funny. He just, he, he, he said, he said, I, I said, I said, Mary Carr, you know, and I told him about the, the National Book Critics Circle Award <laughs> encounter. And I said, um, I, I'm such a fan of hers. I'd love, I'd love to meet her and chat with her. And he said, well, I'll, I'll, I'll have you both to dinner. And I said, well, yeah, but I, I need to, I need to interview her. And he said, I'll have you both to dinner. 
so, you know, kind of made it clear that that, that wasn't so. No, it's so funny because, no. he, well, like I said, he was, um, he was, uh, a, I don't have a bad thing. I mean, that's almost the sad thing is I can see the horrible aspects of his character from reading his books and from reading about his life. We have to talk at some point about, um, uh, about his response um, to leaving a doll's house, the Claire Bloom book, um, which I actually did read, um, uh, which he let me read and I took home and read and I could have had a copy of, but I said, I didn't want the responsibility of it. Um, uh, but I thought it was a, his rebuttal, while incredibly self-serving and-, and okay, You're talking about notes for my biographer, yes. right? His, yeah. his rebuttal to his almost paragraph by paragraph rebuttal to leaving a doll's house. I thought yeah. it was pretty convincing, I've got to say. I mean, yeah. Do you disagree? No, I just think that it was, again, uh, as Hermione and John, Hermione Lee and, and Jonathan Brandt, both very good friends of Philip, told him, they used the exact same phrase relentlessly self justifying. And it did make him seem like a bully, you know, um, like he was, and he was kind of being a wise ass about things um, as he couldn't resist being like when he was talking about his relationship with the woman I call Inga in right. my book. Right. Let me ask you a question before we start taking some questions from, um, and, and, and give it to me straight, Mary. Okay. Did you think I was fair in representing the, the relationship with Claire Bloom in my book? Um, it seemed, I mean, it seemed fair to me. I mean, he had told me the most damning incidents he had told me about. So, I mean, I don't think there were, uh, I, I, I don't know. I get, I mean, I didn't take notes on it, but on that aspect of the book, but you I remember ever becoming, uh, uh provoked by um, my perhaps being too lenient on Philip or too lenient on Claire? Provoked, you know, in such a way that you would remember it later? No, I would have moved the Anatole Broyard back to the 60s. I'll tell you why. That was your only qualm. My only qualm. Well, because it's the end of his life. Right. And, and I understand the need to not have the litany of, of ailments. He had so many health problems. Um, but, you know, I, and, and I thought you, you really captured, did you read Ben Taylor's book, which I think is extraordinary? Um, yes, I did. I enjoyed it. Didn't you think it was like a beautiful kind of portrait of him? If you haven't read, uh, uh, read that book, I think it's an amazing memoir about it. Is. Um, and I, I, I think that, um, Ben, brought out the best in Philip, um, as, as certain people did. Lisa Halliday certainly brought out the best in Philip. Um, also brought out a mischievousness that Ben didn't much provoke to the same degree. Um, what I, 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 I thought there were aspects of, of Philip's personality which did not come across in Ben's uh, book, the, the less appetizing aspects of Philip's personality. I just, I thought he was, um... I got to spend time with him and it was like two uh, 10 year olds <laughs> in a verbal jousting match or something. It was like they practically struck fencing positions and, but they also, it was just laughs. It was just, just crazy laughs hanging out with Philip and Ben. By the way, I should, I should point out it, 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 now that I think of it, the Broyard thing was not your only qualm by any means. It was the only qualm that I didn't, uh, but that, that, that I didn't uh, accede to. Well, can I, yeah, the name of the book. Every, everything else you suggested, I incorporated, but not that. Thanks, Angus, for mentioning this. The name of the Ben Taylor book is Here We Are. Um, and I think it's a beautiful memoir. No, I think, uh, I think you're going to, I think you, there's a Pulitzer waiting down the road. I, you're not even supposed to say things like that um, out loud. Uh, and and I was in the room when he read about about Bob Dylan getting the Nobel Prize. I was there. I was the one who showed him on my iPad. I said, "Look who won the Nobel Prize!" And while he's taking reading it on my iPad, going like this, 
I'm taking a picture of him going like that. So. <laughs> um, yeah, we got to take some questions here. Yes, let's take some questions. Um, uh, I'm sorry, you guys, we've gone on so long. There's so many great questions here, and I'm afraid that I'm going to miss everything. Um, how do you, this was one of my questions, Blake, how do you handle having multiple versions of the same story? Um, well, part of that's intuitive, but part of it is also just simply based on the documentary evidence. Um, for example, Philip wrote in the facts that Maggie, when she went to get her abortion, actually went to a Times Square movie house and watched Susan Hayward in I Want to Live, which of course is priceless and, and perfect. That's not what happened. Um, that is because Philip tried literally hundreds of times to fictionalize the Maggie disaster. And as would happen in, frequently with Philip, what he remembered was not the real life episode, but the fictionalized version. Oh, okay. Um, so I, I found letters that Philip had written at the time after Maggie confessed to him in the early 60s saying she didn't have an abortion because there was no baby to abort. She sat in a Turkish bath. Oh, okay, so you always go with the contemporaneous version and not the one 50 years later. Also, um, and I'll give you one more example. Philip got, and I got in a tiff because he saw my note. He had, he had said to, I'm, I'm blanking on her name, some, some person who was writing a book that uh, Maggie stayed in Alden's apartment, uh, you know, uh, at St. Mark's place um, in the summer of 1958. And Philip said, I was only there for a single afternoon. Well, that's not true. Um, Philip and Maggie colonized the place and slept over many, many nights. And Philip saw my notes. It was the one time I showed him my notes. And he went, that didn't happen. And I said, uh, well, you know, that's what Gene Lichtenstein, the, the assistant fiction editor at Esquire back then, told me. And his wife was there. Cynthia Lichtenstein was Maggie's roommate. And he said, well, why do you take his word over mine? And I said, OK, he remembers your friends Tom and Jackie Rogers sleeping in the other bedroom. Now, he never met Tom and Jackie Rogers before or ever after that. So why would he make that up out of whole cloth, these people he didn't even know? Um, sure enough, Susie Rogers checked her father's journal and he had made an entry about Phil and Maggie sleeping in one bedroom and they're sleeping in the other. So you can kind of just put the puzzle pieces. You can kind of put the puzzle pieces. Yeah. I have an idea about this. Which novels did Philip take the greatest pride in? We know the one he hated the most. The Humbling? Oh, I thought it was Portnoy. I thought it was... Oh, no, no, no. You're right. You're right. No, he didn't hate Portnoy as, as a work of art. I mean, he, he, he saw its merits, but it ruined his life as he saw it. You know, every time someone regarded him as an unserious person, as a jerk off artist, you know, a fuck artist, as he put it, he blamed it on Portnoy. Every time he was mistreated as he saw it by cultural journalism, Portnoy, et cetera. Um, he, did they ask for works that he loved, took pleasure in, right? Um, the great American novel, a terrible book um, about <laughs> terrible, endless, endless, endless baseball book with hit or miss gags, most of them just breathtakingly tasteless, um, you know, uh, racist jokes, uh, women jokes, it just, but, but he just had a ball writing, you know, he kept his baseball mitt <laughs> next to his typewriter and just had a whale of a time. Um, he, he, of course, was justifiably proud of American Pastoral. American Pastoral is my favorite favorite book of his. Well, it, it's my second favorite book. Um, what's, your, what's your favorite book? The Ghost Rider. Oh, I like The Ghost Rider too. They're actually nip and tuck. Those are the two. Those are my two favorites. Well, one, like, those are my two favorites too. And you know, I Bruce, love Patrimony too. You know. Uh oh, patrimony. Yeah, for everyone who 
again, who thinks that, you know, Philip is that grim, beetle-browed person in all the later photographs? Read Patrimony. I mean, he was such a darling son to Herman. Would, would get in bed with him and hold his hand and give him warm milk. And, you know, I mean, he was the perfect Jewish son. Read Patrimony. Um, but the thing about American Pastoral, just briefly, was, you know, the, the, the criticism was becoming more and more caustic that um, Philip was a self-referential writer. And even Philip himself said, you know, Bellow and Updike take a flashlight and point it out into the world, and I keep pointing it into the same hole, okay? And Updike just ripped him a new asshole um, when he published Operation Shylock, which had not one Roth-like uh, alter ego, but two <laughs> characters named Philip Roth. So Updike wrote this just demolition in The New Yorker, and Philip said, by God, you know, and he, he writes this beautifully objectified panoramic tragedy about the fall of Newark uh, in the 60s and the loss of innocent and a good, decent man, a businessman, an industrialist, Sweet above, being blindsided. And, and by the even the idealistic daughter, I think, is a kind of a wonderful... Wonderful. A wonderful character. Character, absolutely. So, anyway, there you have it. Um, I'm just looking. Uh, blah, blah. I'm just, I want to be sure. There's a woman here who hated, hated me. <laughs> it's okay. Um, uh, blah, blah. We name drop too much. And we're rude. Um, we do? Yeah. All the name drop. I mean, once you drop Philip Roth, what else? Are, I mean, you know, blah, blah. I'm sorry. I'm looking through this. A lot of it is just this woman saying <laughs> she hates us. Clearly, he was a friend of Mia Farrow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, did he speak of the Farrow and Allen controversy? He certainly did to me. He certainly he? did. And, you know, even before uh, Mia had told uh, Philip about Woody Hello. Allen uh, assaulting his seven-year-old daughter, um, he despised Woody Allen. Um, one knew he was a complete phony, uh, that all the highfalutin allusions to Strindberg and whatnot were completely phony, that he had hardly read a book in his life. Um, and he just thought he was a bad artist, thought when he was trying to be serious, he was mawkish, uh, like, you know, the blind rabbi dancing with his daughter at the end of uh, Crimes and Misdemeanors. Claire Bloom played Martin Landau's wife in that movie, though she had been in close uh, contact with Woody Allen. She said, there's something wrong with that man. You know, he is a human being. He doesn't exist. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I, I, I know Mia, I know Mia <laughs> too, and I also know Dylan Farrow, and I stand by her and support her, and I know what she's saying. Oh, uh, thoroughly decent um, person. Um, um, uh, and anyway, Mia, Mia adored Philip and vice versa. Well, who's, it's hard not to like Mia. Hold on. While Roth gave you access to papers and to people he knew, were there some aspects of his life that you chose not to include? In I can think of only one episode that I made a conscious decision to exclude. And I can explain it without going into the, the niceties of the episode in question. Um, it was, it had to do with Inga, who is the model for Dranka, the insatiable Dranka in Sabbath's theater. Um, and it was a, a, a peccadillo of theirs, um, which does not reflect credit on either party. But I excluded it because one, I already had enough of that sort of material that I did put in the book. And two, it would be just gratuitously embarrassing, and it didn't harm anybody except Philip and Inga. So that's why I left it out. Um, th that's what I, the other, the great question from Andrew Bine, I wondered about this. How, how much of what Blake learned could he not include due to insufficient evidence? Something that you just couldn't marshal enough evidence for that you knew it was true. That, uh, you say this is Andrew Bine wrote that. Andrew, Andrew, that was not my problem. My problem was that I was starting to hear stories for the fifth or sixth or seventh time. 
Okay, so there was no no case that I didn't have enough documentation for. Um, the question about the extent to which written archival material versus oral interviews undergird the biography. That's a question I have too. Thank you. That's from Josiah Daniel. Thank you, Josiah, for that. I'm sorry. The question is... Um, the extent to which written material versus oral interviews you feel undergird the biography. Right. I, you know, um, there's quite a bit of both. Uh, I interviewed um, about 150 people. Um, I interviewed Philip many, many times over the course of six years. Um, I, he gave me all of Ross Miller's tapes, which though Ross didn't interview hardly anybody, he did interview Philip quite a bit. And I had all of that. And I had the other tapes. Judith Thurman did some interviews. Um, Lisa Halliday did some interviews. And Ann and Harry Maurer did interviews. I got all of that. I do all my own transcribing. Um, because people, other people only screw it up. Um, so thousands and thousands and thousands of pages um, of interview material. Um, also, there's the Library of Congress. And at one point, I needed to go back into the warehouse because there were some uncatalogued things there. I needed to find those boxes. As I write in my uh, back matter, it's like the final crane shot. You know, the librarian said, this is the Philip Roth material. It's like the final crane shot in Citizen Kane, <laughs> you know, which finally ends on the rosebud being thrown into the, the fireplace. Um, so there was that. And there was the material, as, as Philip himself described it to the BBC, I have miles of files in my apartment in New York and my house in Connecticut. All that's on the third floor of my house. So I had my hands full. And, and did you did you ever talk, I, we need to wrap up soon. Did you ever talk to somebody and feel just really changed? I mean, one of the things that I discovered about Philip as he was dying was things like, like he bought his cleaning woman a house. I mean, that she had asked him to sign a loan for her so they could buy right. him. He just went and bought her the whole house. I mean, there, I was always finding. Look, yeah, look, how much do you need? How much do you need? And she said $75,000. And he said, here. Yeah. And you don't have to pay me that. Well, she, she told me about that when I was, clean, you know, helping get some of the stuff with Judith, uh, some of the stuff out of the apartment. She wanted his um, dining table. So. Yeah. Let me tell you um, a couple of interviews that, that, made a, an enormous impression on me. Um, Maggie's children, they're both in their 60s now. The daughter, who Philip was sure would be dead because her life had become squalid when he lost touch with her, um, is, lives in the Bay Area, is married to a millionaire, and has two very successful grown-up children. And the, the brother lives, leads an incredibly seedy, ramshackle life in Long Beach, California. Both of them said, Philip Roth saved our lives. Ronald, the one I call Ronald, said, I'm giving you this interview as a tribute to Philip. And Helen kept that picture that I put in my book of him with his arm around her as a little girl on her dresser her entire life. Because he was the first adult, the first adult who treated them with sweetness, I'm getting reclaimed, sweetness and decency, and <clears throat> got them educated you know, got them a proper education, which had been totally neglected. They were illiterate up to then. So, you know, what, what surprised me about Philip was not his occasional bad behavior. It was his decency. Well, it's, yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that's the part I knew. Um, I know. We, well, we, we argued. We argued about sexual politics. We argued about... Sure. Yeah. Um, all kinds of about sex and race and class and all kinds of things. And um, uh, he always had room for me. Uh, and I always I always had room for him. And I was so lucky to have had him in my life. We're winding up. We're running out of time. I'm so grateful. I'm supposed to cook dinner. To, I know you've got to go cook dinner. I'm yeah. so grateful to all of you for joining us and to the Leon Levy Foundation and the Leon Levy Center for Biography. And to Blake, I, I expect you to invite me to your Pulitzer meal. 
Uh, oh, pshaw. Um, I want to say what an honor and a pleasure it's been um, to, to talk with Mary, who I have admired for decades. Oh, pshaw. Go quick. All right, everybody. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for coming. Good night. Good night.